My name is Aurelio Manuel Montemayor, and I'm a senior education specialist at IDRA, the Intercultural Development Research Association. Michelle Vega, who is also an education specialist at IDRA, will be providing expert technical assistance to carry out this webinar. Our webinar title is Youth Tech Mentors Bridge Schools and Families. I'm going to say a little bit about the organization. The Intercultural Development Research Association, IDRA, is an independent nonprofit organization. Our mission is to achieve educational, equal educational opportunity for every child through strong public schools that prepare all students to access and succeed in college. We are committed to the IDRA valuing philosophy, respecting the knowledge and skills of the individuals we work with and build on the strengths of the students and parents and in their schools. This webinar illustrates the leadership yeah. young people can provide to support the education of all children. That's why we call it Youth Tech Mentors. Uh, my name is Thomas Ray Garcia. I'm the founder and executive director of the College Scholarship Leadership Access Program, CSLAP, that provided some internet assistance this past summer. Okay, let's go to Thomas. Thomas, tell us about your work in terms of as a tech mentor. I wanna see. Yeah, so first to start off with, CSLAP is a college access nonprofit. We deliver traditionally services that help graduating seniors get to and through college and provide them near peer mentors from the Valley. So pivoting toward the tech mentorship, we had to go deeper into the foundations of what it means for people to connect with one another and give each other help. So we try to filter everything through the college access lens, but especially when it came to tutoring younger children in subjects like math and English, we wanted to emphasize that people like Adolfo and Isaac are here from the Valley and they want to give back in the best way they can, which is in this unprecedented time, how can we help young people not only understand things like Google Classroom and learn how to download something or to convert something so they can submit their file and get a good grade and pass on to the next grade, but also feel like they're seen and they're heard and that they do have someone outside their immediate family they can reach out to for some assistance. So we help from everything from converting files like PDFs into Word documents so the teacher can accept them, uh, catching up on a lot of uh, backlogged homework that just went on touch, not because the student didn't want to, but because they couldn't do it. They either didn't know how to download the very esoteric app that the teacher required, and no one really knew, including the mentor at first, what exactly it was. They had to look up the manual and how to do it, how to make sure the parents and the student knew how to work together to submit assignments. So every single step of the way, they were very adaptable and flexible to make sure that every single student, whether it was a first grader or a ninth grader, uh, not only could they submit assignments, but they can feel like they're part of a larger community, even through Zoom. Thank you. And since Isaac isn't with us, tell us about Isaac. What was the work that Isaac was doing as a tech mentor? His primary work involved uh, working directly with Arise. One of the key events he did in co-ed with me was training Arise Adelante staff on how to master Zoom. So using Zoom, and mastering it to host events and to uh, do very complex pedagogical techniques with it is very different. So Isaac and I were able to jump on with uh, a lot of Arise Adelante staff from across the valley and to not only translate some English language tools that Zoom offers into Spanish, but also allowing them to practice within a session. Uh, so things like making each other hosts, things like using the breakout rooms eff uh, efficiently and effectively, uh, learning how to mute and unmute and how to get students more uh, inviting, you know, inviting the students to in participate more. So things from the technical side of Zoom to actually how to make it work as a pedagogical tool, uh, Isaac was a great resource for them. And the training he conducted was in Spanish. Yes. Yeah, and that was important. Uh, let me just mention, you've heard the word Arise, a resource in service to equality. It's an organization, a grassroots organization that works in some of the poorest unincorporated communities called Colonias in South Texas along the border. And we have three panelists that come that are actually volunteers in three of their centers. And so um, we will be hearing from them also. Uh, Thomas, then another one of your colleagues, uh, Adolfo Garcia, uh, provided assistance. What kind of assistance did Adolfo provide? Adolfo was the mentor working directly with families 
both that would reach out to CSLAP independently and that Arise Adelante had identified in the community and put them in touch with us. Adolfo was the one on call uh, many hours a week to work with children as young as first graders to high schoolers. And uh, he really pulled through. Uh, he's a tech, a techie himself. Uh, he considers himself a high tech video game. So he knows a lot about software. He knows a lot about how to make the internet an inviting place. And uh, he even went above and beyond just teaching how apps work. Uh, he was also able to tutor younger children in subjects like math and science and to catch them up with the backlogged uh, homework. So he provided not only technical expertise, but also that near peer mentorship that makes CSLAP what it is. Uh, Thomas and his two colleagues, Isaac and Adolfo, are members of the group uh, that is, is actually giving back to the Valley. They all went to school in, in South Texas in the Valley, and they are now providing services and helping out uh, even as they're still going through their college uh, track. Uh, Isaac has hopes to be accepted in medical school. Adolfo, I think, wants to be um, a pharmacist. And uh, Thomas was recently uh, passed his orals for his PhD at the very prestigious college in Los Angeles, University of California in Los Angeles, UCLA. I'm gonna open it up. Um, Thomas, uh, what's your counsel to schools in this COVID period and that everything is distance learning and a lot of it is gonna continue for quite a while. What are some counsels that you give to schools to help these children do better in terms of in distance learning? There are three parts to it. First is, is making sure the foundations are there. Uh, initially in March, there was a uh, race to get everybody a Chromebook, but not realizing at, to a large extent that internet was the main issue. Realizing that internet in parking lots and internet, free internet in parks can work to an extent, but only if uh, students are um, actually in a safe pedagogical mode, which you know, parking in McAllen Park is not really a, a, a great pedagogical space. So now there's local school district response like Donna ISD uh, building Wi-Fi towers uh, in neighborhoods across the city, not just for the school district. So uh, no matter where you live in the city, you can have access to internet. So that's the basic. The second part is adapting pedagogy to the reality of Zoom and other online platforms that we've been hearing. I think simple is the way to go. As a former teacher, I'm tempted to go the innovative route and the creative route, which often means let me get an esoteric app out of the air and then introduce it to my students. But as you've heard, sometimes that just isn't the route because not only do, do young people like Adolfo and Isaac struggle with it, but of course, parents and people from different uh, language backgrounds won't understand it either and it'll be counterproductive. So using something as simple as Zoom, but using it productively which goes to the third part, which is the inherent disconnect between people on an internet platform like Zoom. Uh, we're not in the same room. The pedagogy must adapt to that. How can you make the most out of Zoom without having to fall into the pitfalls of trying to maintain a sense of normalcy when things obviously aren't normal? One example is often what used to be a lecture or a presentation is now a hands-on activity. Because if I'm an educator and I can log into Zoom and share my screen and have my students follow along with me and then log into the same URL and click along with me, it's no longer just a sage on the stage, but it's more so a guide on the side. That has been very effective for college access. When I'm telling students to go to a certain website, we can be on it together. You know, It's the equivalent of us like literally sitting in the same seat and then on the same laptop, except much more conducive that we're on different screens at the same exact time. Uh, and of course, teaching students how to more effectively use software like Google Docs, Google Excel, uh, so they can be on the same document at the same time and uh, being able to update their ways of learning. You know, I think Zoom is great for visual learners, uh, audio learners to an extent, depending how information is conveyed. You also wanna make sure um, sections like the breakout rooms can be used effectively. You're not just sending students to work together by themselves in a corner of Zoom, but you, there's a way to facilitate learning effectively. One way is empowering students to become leaders in their own Zoom rooms, encouraging one student to be the timer, another student to be the one uh, checking in to make sure everybody's muted, for example. If you empower students to have a sense of identity when they log into this Zoom room, 
which is uh, on the surface alienating, but it has the potential to bring people together, including people who are across the country. One last thing I'll say is the whole idea of near peer mentorship and something I think schools and teachers can take advantage of is you can get people into your Zoom room, which is your classroom that you couldn't have otherwise done so easily. So through college access, we're connecting people who have come from the Valley to Microsoft, letting them come into our Zoom room and talk to students about what it means to go to Microsoft from Brownsville ISD to Microsoft, uh, a FAR resident who now works for Boeing. Before that would just be logistically impossible. Uh, now they can just literally hop onto the same Zoom link and educate and be a mentor to our fellow students. So if educators take these positives in mind, I think they can reorient their pedagogy while also understanding the inherent limitations that technology and software can offer, but taking advantage uh, of what it does offer that's new. Wow, that's good, Thomas. You have a lot of good ideas. Yeah. Uh, I didn't mention digital literacy, which I think is implicit in what we're talking about, but the fact that if you try to remember your first introduction to the internet and what life was like before and what life was like after. Uh, <laughs> and the fact that many people are going through that, whether you're young or old right now. So we have a chance to reorient the internet away from what might be a uh, preconception that it's YouTube, it's Facebook, it's social media, it's entertainment towards something that's more empowering. Uh, you can go to websites and get life-saving and life-changing information. Uh, and it doesn't have to be boring. It doesn't have to be painful. It can be life-changing and, and fun. So I think this is an opportunity for many educators to take advantage of already existing software. There's no need to be overly experimental, but to keep in mind when you introduce something like Zoom, uh, how are you orienting the atmosphere in it to really make students love coming to class or a educational website you might be taking advantage of? So it's not a burden for students, but rather an opportunity that they and their parents can take advantage of after uh, all of this is over. Okay, um, Thomas, I want, I want you to talk a little bit more about what uh, Adolfo was doing because he was working with one family, with several families. What were the specific kinds of, 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 of techniques he was using to work with the family? One way he helped was determining the best mode to communicate with them. And so it, we're kind of assuming that everybody's just jumping onto Zoom and doing things. First, you have to learn how to use Zoom. So first he would be on the phone and guiding them through how to download Zoom or to download Google uh, meetups or different types of uh, ways of connecting with each other through screen. First, he would have to teach them step-by-step step how to share your screen, how to look at the website effectively. And in some cases, he would guide the lesson by sharing his own screen and using apps everybody knew. So everybody knew how to open up a Microsoft Word document. Uh, so if they didn't know Google Docs, that was fine. He would do Microsoft Word and he would do the lesson on his end. So first he would assess the whole framework, like what needed to be learned. And I think teachers can learn from that, which is you gotta identify the gaps before you can learn how to fill them. You can't make too many assumptions or else you're just gonna get way ahead and people aren't gonna be able to catch up. So step one is making sure everybody can communicate on some decent level. Uh, I think he did that very effectively by first starting on the phone and then saying, okay, well, it turns out you can use Zoom, you know how to use it. Do you know all the different features? Like, do you know how to share your screen effectively? Uh, do you know how to use the breakout rooms effectively? And then once he slowly taught them the logistics, uh, the pedagogy followed to where he learned he can uh, be on the same call with the parent and the student and the parent can learn along with the student. And it turns out the student can do the work just fine. They just need to be able to learn where to type it in and how to save the document. So when it came to actually tutoring the younger ones, it was very easy for them to follow along uh, once the framework was set up. Which programs are working best for you as you're a student and which are the ones that, that teachers or professors are using that are most challenging for you? You know, Aurelio, I can start by uh, briefly mentioning that I had taught a course uh, back in the spring. I had an opportunity to teach a college course to UCLA undergrads. Uh, and this was back when everything was starting. So it was also thrown on me to learn how Zoom worked and how to make it simple as possible for everybody going through the same thing. So I used Zoom and I used a uh, WordPress blog. Uh, one addendum to what I wanted to say earlier was uh, with Zoom and with online learning in general, you can do things that you couldn't do before. One thing is take advantage of the fact that high schoolers and college students, it's good for them to start getting professionally developed by creating online artifacts. So when you Google your own name, it's not just your social media coming up, but it's something like a WordPress blog where my students were able to do service learning projects digitally 
and they were able to write and reflect on it. So very simple tools where they log into a blog website, they type in their assignment, they post it, and it's a permanent thing that uh, later on they can look at and say, during the pandemic, I did this. Uh, it didn't require a unique app. It didn't require new types of learning. Uh, it was just making do with what we had. Uh, but keeping it simple was my approach. Now, you had a class where students, you were teaching a literature class where students did community service, connecting their experience in literature. What were some of the experiences that some of your students had in, in that project? Initially, the course was a service learning project based uh, hands on course where they would do literary analysis in the class and they would get spread out throughout Los, An Los Angeles to actually uh, do some type of service ranging from education, tutoring to environmentalism, uh, planting trees. Uh, here online, all of that transformed to where instead of thinking of it in terms of topics like environmentalism, education, labor, they were thinking in terms of uh, peer mentoring versus distance blank. It might be distance mentoring, distance tutoring, distance, uh, long distance uh, pen pals. And they were able to use data to their advantage where they said, okay, I met with someone many times on Zoom. I was able to get this many uh, students tutored at this time. I was able to do this kind of work uh, by quantifying everything. Uh, one of the ones that stands out to me is someone got over 20 people registered to vote via postcards. She worked together with a local nonprofit that was getting out the vote and trying to get re people re-registered to vote who had been kicked off the rolls uh, in different states. So all it took was getting organized on Zoom on the internet, and then she wrote postcards, sent them out, and they were able to confirm that those people got registered to vote, uh, including to, uh, in addition to a lot of mentoring, tutoring, and other things that you can do via the internet. So I want to thank you all for participating. Uh, you all gave many examples of how young people and young adults can be a very important assistance in this age of the COVID-19 and all the, um, all the challenges of distance learning. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Aurelio. Thank you.